This book belongs to the very few. Maybe not one of them is yet alive, unless he is to be one of those who understands my Zarathustra. How can I confine myself with those who today already find a hearing? Only the day after tomorrow belongs to me. Some are born posthumously. I am only too well aware of the conditions under which a man understands me, and then necessarily understands. He must be intellectually upright to the point of hardness. In order to even endure my seriousness and my passion, he must be used to living on mountaintops and to feeling the wretched gabble of politics and national egotism beneath him. He must have become indifferent. He must have never inquired whether truth is profitable or whether it may prove fatal. Possessing from strength a predilection for questions for which no one has enough courage nowadays, the courage for the forbidden. His predestination must be the labyrinth, the experience of seven solitudes, new ears for new music, new eyes for the most remote things, new conscious for truths which hitherto have remained dumb, and the will to economy on a large scale, the husband, his strength, and his enthusiasm. He must honor himself. He must love himself. He must be absolutely free with regard to himself. Very well, then. Such men alone are my readers, my proper readers, my preordained readers. Of what account are the rest? Uh, the, the rest are simply humanity. One must be superior to humanity in power, in loftiness of soul, in contempt. Let us look each other in the face. We are Hyperboreans. We know well enough how far outside the crowd we stand. Thou will find the way to the Hyperboreans, neither by land nor water. Pindar already knew this much about us. Beyond the north, the ice and death. Our life. Our happiness. We discovered happiness. We know the way. We found the way out of thousands of years of the labyrinth. Who else would have found it? <laughs> not the modern man, surely. I do not know where I am or what I am to do. I am everything that knows not where it is or what to do, sighs the modern man. We were made quite ill by this modernity, with its indolent peace, its cowardly compromise, and the whole of its virtuous filth of yea and nay. This tolerance and longer detour which forgives everything because it understands everything, is a Syrico for us. We prefer to live amid ice than to be breathed upon by modern virtues and other southerly winds. We were brave enough. We spared neither ourselves nor others, but we were very far from knowing whether to direct our bravery. We were becoming gloomy. People called us fatalists. Our fate... It was the abundance, the tension, and the storing up of power. We thirsted for thunderbolts and great deeds. We kept the most respectable distance from the joy of the weakling, from resignation. Thunder was in our air. The part of our nature which we are became overcast, for we had no direction. The formula of our happiness, a yea. A nay, a straight line, a goal. What is good? All that enhances the feeling of power, the will to power, and power itself in man. What is bad? All that proceeds from weakness. What is happiness? The feeling that power is increasing, that resistance has been overcome, not contentment, not more power, not peace at any price, but war, not virtue, but efficiency. Virtue in the Renaissance sense, virtua, free from all morlic acid. The weak in the bot shall perish. 
first principle of our humanity, and they ought even be helped to perish. What is more harmful than any vice? Practical sympathy with all the botched and the weak Christianity. The problem I set in this work is not what will replace mankind in the order of living beings. Man is an end. But what type of man must be reared, must be willed, as having the highest value, as being the most worthy of life and the surest guarantee of the future? This more valuable type has appeared often enough already, but has been a happy accident, as an exception, never as willed. He has rather been precisely the most feared hitherto. He has become almost the terrible in itself. And from out the very fear he provoked there arose the will to rear the type which has now been reared, attained, the domestic animal, the gregarious animal, the sick animal man, the Christian. Mankind does not represent a development towards a better, stronger, or higher type in the sense in which it is supposed to occur today. Progress is merely a modern idea. That is to say, a false idea. The modern European is still far below the European of the Renaissance in value. The progress of evolution does not by any means imply elevation, enhancement, or the increasing of strength. On the other hand, isolated and in individual cases are continually succeeding at different places on Earth as the outcome of most different cultures, and in these higher type certainly manifests itself something which, by the side of mankind in general, represents a kind of Superman. Such lucky strokes of great success have always been possible, and will perhaps always be possible. And even whole races, tribes, and even nations may, in certain circumstances, represent such lucky strokes. We must not deck out and adorn Christianity. It has waged a deadly war upon this higher type of man. It has set a ban upon the fundamental instincts of this type. It has distilled evil and the devil himself out of these instincts. The strong man as the typical pyra, the villain. Christianity has sided with everything weak, low, and botched. It has made an ideal out of antagonisms towards the self-preserving instincts of a strong life. It has corrupted the reasons of the strongest intellects by teaching that the highest values of intellectually are sinful, misleading, and full of temptations. The most lamentable example of this was the corruption of Pascal, who believed in the perversion of his reason through original sin, whereas it had only been perverted by his Christianity. A painful and ghastly spectacle has just risen before my eyes. I tore down the curtain, which concealed mankind's corruption. This word in my mouth is at least secure from the suspicion that it contains a moral charge against mankind. It is, I would fain to emphasize this again, free from moralic acid. To such an extent is this so, that I am most thoroughly conscious of the corruption in question precisely in those quarters to which hitherto people have aspired with the most determination to virtue and to godliness. As you have already surmised, I understand corruption in the sense of decadence. What I maintain is this, that all the values upon which mankind builds its highest hopes and desires are decadent values. I call an animal, a species, an individual, corrupt when it loses its instincts, when it selects and prefers that which is detrimental to it. A history of the higher feelings, of human ideals, and it is not impossible that I should have to write it, would almost explain why man is so corrupt. Life itself, to my mind, is nothing more nor less than the instinct of growth, of permanence, of accumulating forces of power, where the will of power is lacking. Denigration sets in. My contention is that the highest values of mankind lack this will, that the values decline and of nihilism 
are exercising this sovereign power under the cover of the holiest names. Christianity is called the religion of pity. Pity is opposed to the tonic passions which enhance the energy and the feeling of life. Its action is depressing. A man loses power when he pities. By means of pity, the drain on strength, which suffering already itself introduces into the world, is multiplied a thousandfold. Through pity, suffering becomes infectious. In certain circumstances, it may lead to the total loss of life and vital energy, which is absolutely out of proportion to the magnitude of the cause. In the case of the death of the Nazarene. This is the first standpoint, but there is still more important one. Supposing one measures pity according to the value of the reactions it usually stimulates, its danger to life appears in a much more telling light. On the whole, pity thwarts the law of development, which is the law of selection. It preserves that which is ripe for death. It fights in favor of the disheartened and the condemned of life. Thanks to the multitude of abortions of all kinds which it maintains life, it lends life itself a somber and questionable aspect. People have dared to call pity a virtue. In every noble culture, it's considered a weakness. People still went further. They exalted it as the virtue, the root and the origin of all virtues. <laughs> but, of course, what must never be forgotten is the fact that what was done from the standpoint of the philosophy which was nihilistic and on whose shield the device, the denial of life, was inscribed. Scrofenhauer was right in this respect. By means of pity, life is denied and made more worthy of denial. Pity is the proxis of nihilism. I repeat, this is this depressing and infectious instinct thwarts those instincts which aim at the preservation and enhancement of the value of life. <laughs> By multiplying misery quite as much as preserving all that is miserable. It is by the principal agent of promoting decadence. Pity extorts people to nothing, to non-entity. And they do not say non-entity, they say beyond, or God, or the true life, or nirvana, or salvation, or blessedness. Instead, this innocent rhetoric, which belongs to the realm of the real to the religio moral syncrasity immediately appears to be very much less innocent if one realizes what the tendency is here tries to drape itself in the mantle of sublime expressions the tendency of hostility to life <laughs> Schopenhauer was hostile to life that is why he elevated pity to a virtue. <sighs> Aristotle, as you know, recognized in pity a morbid and dangerous state, of which it was wise to rid oneself of from time to time by a prerogative. He regarded tragedy as a prerogative. For the sake of the instinct of life, it would certainly seem necessary to find some means of lancing any such morbid and dangerous accumulation of pity as that which possessed Schopenhauer, and, unfortunately, the whole of our literacy and artistic decadence as well, from St. Petersburg to Paris to Tolstoy to Wagner, if only to make it burst. Nothing is more unhealthy in the midst of our unhealthy modernity than Christian pity. To be doctors here, to be inexorable here, to wield a knife effectively here. All this is our business. All this is our kind of love to our fellows. This is what makes us philosophers. Us hyperboreans. <clears throat> it is necessary to say whom we regard as our antithesis. The theologians and all those who have the blood of theologians in their veins, the whole of our philosophy. A man must have had his very nose upon this fatality, or better still, he must have experienced it in his own soul. He must have almost have perished through it, in order to be unable to treat this matter lightly. The free-spirited of our friends, the naturalist, and the physiologist, in my opinion, a joke. What they lack in these questions is passion. 
what they lack is having suffered from these questions. This poisoning extends much further than people think. I unearth the arrogant instinct of the theologian wherever nowadays people feel themselves idealist, wherever, thanks to the superior and decadence, they claim the right to rise above reality and regard it with suspicion. Like the priest and the idealist has every grandiloquent concept in his hand. And not only his hand, he wields them with all kindly contempt against the understanding, the senses, honors, decent living, science. He regards such things as beneath him, as, de as depremental and seductive forces upon the face by which the spirit moves in pure absoluteness, as if humanity, chastity, poverty, in a word, holiness, has not done incalculably more harm to life hitherto than any sort of horror or vice. Pure spirit is pure falsehood, as long as the priest, the professional denier, cumulative of the poisoner of life, is considered the highest kind of man, there can be no answer to the question, what is truth? Truth has already been turned topsy-turny, when the conscious advocate of non-entity and of all denial passes as the representative of truth. It is upon this theological instinct that I wage war. I find traces of it everywhere. Whoever has the blood of theologians in his veins stands from the start in a false and dishonest position to all things. The pathos which grows out of this state is called faith. That is to say, to shut one's eyes once and for all, in order not to suffer at the sight of incurable falsity. People convert this faulty view of all things into a moral, a virtue, a thing of holiness. They endow their distorted vision with good conscience, and they claim no other point of view is any longer of value. Once theirs has been made sacrament with the names God, salvation, eternity, I unearth this instinct of the theologian everywhere. It is the most universal and actually the most subterranean form of falsity on earth. That which a theologian considers true must, of necessity, be false. This furnishes almost the criterion of truth. It is his most profound, self-preservative instinct which forbids reality ever to attain in honor any way, or even to raise its voice. Whither to whoever the influence of the theologian extends, Valutations are topsy-turny, and the concepts true and false have necessarily changed places. That which is the most deleterious to life is here considered true. That which enhances it, elevates it, says yeah to it, justifies it, and renders it as triumphant is called false. It should happen to the theologians via the conscious, either of princes or of the people, stretch out their hand for power. Let us not be in any doubt as to what results, therefore, each time, namely, the will to the end. The nihilistic will to power. Among Germans, I am immediately understood when I say that philosophy is ruined by the blood of theologians. The Protestant minister is the grandfather of German philosophy. Protestantism itself is the latter's original sin. Definition of Protestantism, the partial paralysis of Christianity, and of reason. One needs only to pronounce the words to be in seminary in order to understand what the German philosophy really is at its bottom, i.e., Theology in disguise. The Swabians are the best liars in Germany. They lie innocently. Whence came all the rejoicing, which was the appearance of Kant, who was greeted by the scholastic world of Germany, three quarters of which consisted of clergymen and schoolmasters' sons. Whence came the German conviction, which finds a better echo even now, that Kant inaugurated a change for the better? The theologian's instinct of the German scholar divined what had once again been made possible, a back staircase leading to, into the old ideal which was discovered, the concept of true world, the concept of morality as the essence of the world, those two most vicious errors that have 
ever existed, where, thanks to the subtle and wily skepticism, once again, if not demonstrable, at least no longer refutable. Reason, the prerogative of reason, does not extend so far. Out of reality, they had made appearance. And an absolutely false world, that of being, had been declared to be reality. Kant's success is merely a theologian's success. Like Luther and like Leibniz, Kant was one break. The more upon the already squeaky wheel of the German uprightness. And one more word against Kant as a moralist. Virtue must be our invention. Our most personal defense and need. In every other sense, it is merely a danger. That which does not constitute a condition of our life is merely harmful to it. To possess a virtue, merely because one happens to respect the concept, quote, virtue, unquote, as Kant would have us do, is pernicious. Virtue, duty, goodness itself, goodness stamped with the character of impersonality and universal validity. These things are mere mental hallucinations in which decline the final devaluation of life and the Konigsberg Chinadom find expression. The most fundamental laws of preservation and growth demand precisely the reverse, namely, that each should discover his own virtue, his own categorical imperative. A nation goes to the dogs when it confines its concept of duty with the general concept of duty. Nothing is more profoundly, more thoroughly pernicious than every impersonal feeling of duty and every sacrifice of the molark of abstraction. Fancy no one's having thought Kant's categorical imperative dangerous to life. The instinct of the theologist alone took it under its wing. An action stimulated by the instinct of life is proved to be the proper action by happiness that accompanies it. And that nihilist with the bowels of the Christian dogmatist regarded happiness as an objection. What is there that destroys a man more speedily than to work, <clears throat> to think, to feel as an automation of duty without internal promptings, without a profound personal predilication, without joy? This is the recipe par excellence of the decadence of even idiocracy. Kant became an idiot, and he and he was the contemporary of Goloth. This fatal spider was regarded as the German philosopher, and still regarded as such. <laughs> I refrain from saying what I think about the Germans. <laughs> Did Kant not see in the French Revolution the transition of the state from the inorganic to the organic form? Did he not ask himself? Rather, there was a single event on record which could be explained otherwise in the moral faculty of mankind, <laughs> so that by means of it, mankind's tendency towards good might be proved once and for all. Kant's reply, that is the revolution. Instinct at fault in anything and everything. Hostility to nature as an instinct. German decadence made into a philosophy. Yeah. That is Kant. Except for a few skeptics, the respectable type in the history of philosophy, the rest do not know the very first prerequisite of intellectual uprightness. They all behave like females to these great enthusiasts and animal prodigies. They regard beautiful feelings themselves as arguments, as heaving breast as the bellows of divinity and conviction of the criterion of truth, in the end even Kant, with his Teutonic innocence, tried to dress his this lack of intellectual consciousness up in scientific garb by means of concept of practical reason. He deliberately invented a kind of reason which at times would allow one to dispense with reason, that is to say, when morality when the sublime command, thou shalt, makes itself heard. When one remembers that in almost all nations the philosopher is only a further development of the priestly type, this heirloom of priesthood, this fraud towards oneself, no longer surprises one. When a man 
as a holy life task. As, for instance, to improve, save, or deliver mankind when a man bears God in his breast and is the mouthpiece of impervatives from another world, which such a mission he stands beyond the pale of all merely reasonable valuations. He is even sanctified by such a taste and is already the type of higher order. What does a priest care about science? He stands too high for that. And until now, the priest has ruled. He it was who determined the concept true and false. Do not let us undervalue the fact that we ourselves, we free spirits, are already a transvaluation of all values, an incarnate decoration of war against all old concepts true and untrue, and of triumph over them. The most valuable standpoints are always the last to be found, but the most valuable standpoints are the methods all the methods and the first principles of our modern scientific procedure, had for years to encounter the profoundest contempt, association with the meant exclusion from the society of decent people. One was regarded as an enemy of God, as a scoffer at truth, and as one possessed with one's scientific nature. One belonged to the Chandala, we have had the whole feeling of mankind against us, whither to our notion of that which ought to be truth, of that which ought to serve the purpose of truth. Every thou shalt has been directed against us. Our objects, our practices, our calm, cautious, distrustful manner, everything about us seemed to them absolutely despicable and beneath contempt. After all, it might be asked with some justice whether the thing which kept mankind blind for so long, aesthetic taste. What they demanded of truth was a picturesque effect, and from the man of science what they expected was that he should make a forcible appeal to the senses. It was our modesty which ran counter to their taste for so long, and oh, how well they guessed this, did these divine turkey cocks. We have altered our standpoint. In every respect, we became more modest. We no longer derive from man the, quote, spirit, unquote, and from the, quote, godhead, unquote. We have thrust him back among the beast. We regard him as the strongest animal because he's the craftiest. One of the results thereof, of his intellect. On the other hand, we guard ourselves against this vain pretension, which even here would fain assert itself that man is the great eri pense of organic evolution. He is by no means the crown of creation. Beside him, every other creature stands at the same stage of perfection. And even in asserting this, we go a little too far, for, relatively speaking, man is the most botched and diseased of animals. And he's wandered the furthest up from his instincts. Be this as it may, he is certainly the most interesting. As regards to animals, Descartes was really the first, with really admirable daring, to venture the thought that the beast was Mechina. And the whole of our psych physiology is endeavoring to prove this pre-proposition. Moreover, logically, we do not set man apart, as Descartes did. The extent to which man is understood today goes only as far as he has been understood mechanistically. Formerly, man was given free will, as his dowry from a higher sphere. Nowadays, we've robbed him of even his will, in view of the fact that no such faculty is any longer known. The only purpose served by the old word will is to designate a result. The sort of individual reaction which necessarily follows upon a host of partially discordant and partially harmonious stimuli. The will no longer affects or moves anything. Formerly, people thought that the man's conscious, his spirit, was a proof of his lofty origin, of his divinity. With the idea of perfecting man, he was conjured to draw his senses inside himself 
after the manner of the tortoise, to cut off all relations to, with terrestrial things, and to divest himself of his mortal shell, <laughs> then the most important thing about him, the, quote, pure spirit, unquote, would remain over. Even concerning these things, we have improved our standpoint. Consciousness, spirit, now seems to us rather a symptom of relative imperfection in the organism as an experiment, a groping, a misapprehension, an affliction which absorbs an unnecessary quantity of nervous energy. We deny that anything can be done perfectly so long it is, as it is done consciously. Quote, pure spirit, unquote, is a piece of, quote, pure stupidity, unquote. If we discount the nervous system, the senses, and the mortal shell, we have miscalculated. That is all. Robert Kirby here. Hope you enjoyed. Because if you didn't, what's wrong with you?